Good morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Brandon. Uh, glad that you're worshiping us uh, here with us uh, this morning. We're beginning our summer sermon series. Uh, we'll be walking through our, our Second Corinthians readings. Uh, the theme is a lifeline's God-given hope. Uh, in all circumstances. So we'll kind of unpack what that means a little bit later on in the service, but that'll kind of be a theme uh, throughout the next, uh, the next few weeks. I'd encourage you to take a moment uh, during the first part of the service, fill out your attendance card. They're located in the pew in front of you. Uh, it's a white card if you're a member, gold if you're visiting here with us. Uh, and those will be collected by our ushers as they return back from bringing forward the offering uh, later on in the service. Uh, again, glad that uh, you're here, and uh, we will, as you're able, please rise for opening song. begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
We always start off our services here at Zion with a a confession of sin and with the receiving of forgiveness uh, from God. And so to do that, to help us reflect on our sin this morning, we're going to begin with our Old Testament lesson, the, uh, uh, the, the Genesis 3 reading where sin enters into the world. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God's own word tells us that our sin is what causes troubles, doubts, fears, and even death itself. And for this reason, God sent his son, taking the sin of the whole world on himself and paying for it with his death on the cross. All who have been baptized in his name have died with him and live in forgiveness of sin. So therefore, let us implore him again and again for his forgiveness and his life. Oh God, I confess to you that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and deeds by my own fault. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, forgive me my sins and restore to me the hope of your eternal salvation. God, be merciful to you and strengthen you. I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
my life began. Almighty and eternal God, your son Jesus triumphed over the prince of demons and freed us from our bondage to sin. Help us to stand firm against every assault of Satan and enable us always to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our gospel reading. Our gospel for this morning comes from Mark 3. And Mark writes, Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan is risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called to him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
sermon text is from our epistle reading from 2 Corinthians, beginning at chapter 4. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal." Oh, one more verse. Here we go. (laughs) For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're beginning our summer sermon series called Lifelines, God-given hope in all circumstances. And for me, when I hear the word lifelines, I have a very specific memory. And I'm wondering if any of the rest of you guys have the same. So when I hear lifelines, I think, who wants to be a millionaire? And not just the show in general, I think of the first person to win a million dollars on who wants to be a millionaire. The guy's name was John Carpenter. And so the, if, if you're familiar with the show, it's been on for about 25 years or so. Uh, the lifelines are meant if you're stumped with a question, you can get some help. But it's kind of cool if you don't have to, have to use them. I mean, they're there if you need them. But, but, so John Carpenter uh, was 
uh, going through the questions, breezing through them, he gets all the way to the million dollar question, and he has used zero lifelines. So Reed just reads the question, and his first response is, I'm going to call my parents. He's finally using one of his lifelines. He's finally stumped. They get his dad on the line, and here's what John says. Dad, I don't need your help. I just want to let you know that I'm going to win the million dollars. And then he proceeds to give the right answer, and he becomes the first person to win who wants to be a millionaire. It's nice to have the lifelines in case of emergency, but what's even better is if you don't have to use them. And I think oftentimes that's how we end up treating the gifts of God when we think of lifelines. Yeah, it's good to know uh, that God has these gifts for me, that God's preparing a place for me, but it doesn't really impact my my day-to-day. I have them in case of emergency, but it's really great if I don't have to use them. But when we think about the lifelines that God gives us, it's not just in case of emergency. Though God is our ever-present help in trouble, lifelines actually is more commonly uh, used to talk about our, our veins and our arteries in our body. They're the very things that give us life. And so it's in, in both of these senses that, that we're going to look at the gifts of God. Not just in, in difficult time, not just in emergency, but also in everyday life. You and I can have hope through the gifts that God gives to us. And the gift that God gives here in our text from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is the gift of perspective. And I'm glad this is kind of the first a gift that we see in the text because oftentimes I hear this and we go, oh man, we're good at this. We can give Christian perspective uh, all the time. Right? To, to, to see someone's circumstances and be able to give a Christian perspective to that. The problem is we're really bad at it. But we think we're doing it right. Let me kind of explain. When we see someone that's going through troubles, oftentimes our initial response is not the most helpful. We think we're giving perspective, though. So we'll tell someone something like, it's not that bad. We do this oftentimes with kids. They're holding a balloon. The balloon flies up. And what does every single adult say? It's just a balloon. We'll get you another one. Right? It's not that bad. And even sometimes we'll use the Bible to back us up. Have you read the book of Job? Man, he lost everything. It's not that bad. You, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. We think we're offering Christian perspective. It's not that bad. Or anytime we start a sentence using the words, at least, at least she lived a good long life. At least you can get married again. At least you can have more kids. We think we're offering hope, offering comfort. But the reality is all we're doing is discounting and trying to minimize the suffering, the problems of the people around us. I I heard this at a funeral for a young child. The statement was made, God must have known she was going to have a tough life. We're trying to be helpful. We're trying to offer a Christian perspective. In fact, we're even talking for God. The problem is, God didn't say that. What we're doing in each of these cases, thinking we're offering hope, thinking we're giving perspective, is what we're doing is we look at someone's problems and we go, man, that's a lot to carry. You know how I can help? I'll try to make that problem seem smaller. It could be worse. At least it's not this. Here's what God must be doing. If I can make that problem smaller for them, then they can better carry it on their own. It's well-intentioned. The problem is it's not how God has wired us to go through problems. Christian perspective is not taking the difficulties of life shrinking them down into something manageable that I can deal with on my own. 
No, Christian perspective is being honest about whatever we're dealing with in life. But it's also being honest about who our God is in the midst of whatever the problem is. Because we do this not just when we're giving advice to other people, we all also do this to ourselves when we're struggling. You and I, too often we look at our own lives and we go, hey, it's not that bad. I shouldn't be this upset. Other people have it way worse than me. And then we end up thinking, what's wrong with me that I can't deal with this? Our natural reaction is to try to minimize our pain, thinking if I make it more manageable, then I'll be able to handle it on my own. I don't need those lifelines. I'll just save those for when things get really bad. And when we do so, we are missing out on the hope, on the perspective that God gives to us. Here again the words of our text from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Paul doesn't ignore the difficulties. Of life. Our outer self is wasting away. And that's not a good thing. That's a big problem. The church in Corinth is undergoing persecution. They're experiencing division, hardships of all kind. And he says, our outer self is wasting away. Christian perspective honestly looks at the weight of whatever it is we're handling. And we say, this is not good. Right? Sin and death and disease and conflict, these are all the enemy, and we're going to name them for exactly what they are. This is not good. This is more than you can handle. But if we stop there, that's not giving hope either. We say, man, that's really bad. That, that's, not, that's not hope. And so Christian perspective doesn't just acknowledge the weight of what is going on. It also points us to who our God is and how He is greater and He overcomes in the midst of of whatever it is that we're facing. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What Christian perspective does for us, instead of trying to lighten, trying to minimize, trying to discount, trying to discard the problems we experience in life, Christian perspective calls us to honestly look at the weight that we're carrying, but also to point us to the hope that you are not carrying that alone, you are not carrying that forever. There is an end to whatever it is. That's weighing you down now. But also, there is a weight of glory. There is something greater that is coming, and that in Christ Jesus is already here. And because of that, it enables us to keep going, to not lose heart with whatever we're carrying now. And we kind of understand this weight of glory in everyday life. Those of you all that have experienced uh, labor in childbirth, uh, just a little friendly advice for someone that's in the room. Don't uh, downplay how difficult that is. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that bad. No. But the weight of that pain is nothing compared to the weight of glory when that child is in your arms. It, it, that there's still pain, there's still difficulty, but it, it is outweighed. That moment your pain is outweighed by, by the joy being a parent. Think about working hard in school and continually working over and over again. And, and then you finally get to the point where you walk across that stage. And you look back and you go, no, that was hard. It was work. It was difficult. But the weight of that suffering is but a moment compared to the weight of the glory of the accomplishment. 
How much more is that true for the weight of glory that is awaiting for us in heaven, in the new creation, but also the glory of God who has come to us in Jesus Christ? Is it the weight of whatever we're carrying is strong. It's, it's deep. It's great. But the hope that we have is that your God is even greater. The pain of death, of disease, of conflict is great. But your God is even greater. For he has overcome the grave. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, so too will all those who are in Christ Jesus. The pain of walking through grief, of missing a loved one, is indeed deep. But the joy, the weight of the glory of the resurrection, of eternal life with Christ Jesus is deeper still. For the time we are, we are missing that loved one is just a moment compared to eternity with them in the new creation. The weight of our sin, the way we have hurt others is indeed great. But the love, the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ is even greater. You cannot out sin the grace of God. Even the best thing that we experience in this life is great, is a blessing from God that we rejoice for, but it is nothing. It pales in comparison to the weight of glory of being in the full presence of God forever and ever. That is what Paul is fixing the church's eyes on, a church undergoing tremendous pressure the church that, if it was walking on its own, would crumble under the weight of their problems. But instead, he, he points them to this weight of glory. That God is greater than whatever it is you're facing. That God has and will overcome for you the troubles of this life. That your problems have an end date, but Jesus does not. So we can have hope. Not in minimizing our circumstances, our problems, so that we can carry it on our own, but in recognizing that God is greater. That, that He is stronger. That He has overcome and will overcome for you. Though this outer self is wasting away inwardly, that we would be renewed day by day by the overcoming promises and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of that, we have hope. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen. This time our, our service continues with a gathering of our offerings as well as with our children's message. I invite our children uh, to join me up front. guys come on up all right so I want us to think a little bit a little bit down the road uh, what's something that you can't do yet now but that you're looking forward to do maybe as you get bigger or older or something like that something you can't do yet but that you're looking forward to down the road Oh, going on a roller coaster. Awesome, right? And then you get my age and you can't go on them anymore because you get sick. Uh, but yeah, going on a roller coaster, you, meet, you have to be tall enough to be able to go. That's a great example. Dang. Driving a car, that's, that's, uh, that's been said at all, all three services. You want to drive a car, right? And that, that, that's something that you're looking forward to. Yeah, one more. Henry. Oh, yeah. 
Maybe, maybe ha having, uh, being able to, back in my day, we used to talk to people on the phone. Uh, now that's just an app that you don't use on your phone. But yeah, you know, being able to, uh, to, to, to use a phone. Uh, uh, any of you guys, can any of you guys dunk a basketball yet? Yeah, if the, if the hoop's lower, yeah, yeah, you, you can uh, kind of do that. Or uh, maybe some of you someday will fly a plane uh, or, or uh, fly a rocket into space or something like that. There's all sorts of things, gifts that God gives us that we have to look forward to, right? But there's also, that doesn't mean God doesn't have gifts for you today. Right? God has gifts for you in the day. And, and we look at the gifts that God gives us in heaven and how awesome that's going to be. But God has gifts for us today as well. Every day, God gives us his gifts. And so there, some of the gifts that we've gotten today already in, in God's word, uh, Pastor Kale uh, spoke the words of forgiveness, right? that all, all your sins are forgiven. That was a gift God gave you this morning. Ah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, the gift that God is, God is present. God is here right now. God is here with you. God, God is here wherever you go. That is a gift that you have, uh, that God has given you today. So there's some gifts of God that, yeah, we'll look forward to, uh, that God, God's going to give us in heaven and, and later throughout our life. But also recognize that God gives you great gifts each and every day because he is always with you no matter what. All right, let's take our hands and let's fold them. I'll, I'll say some words of prayer, then we'll repeat those back to God. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us your gifts each and every day. Help us always to share those gifts with those around us. Thank you for giving us hope. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can head back to your seats, and we'll continue by our ushers bringing forward our offering. Hey, see you. Heavenly Father, you give us all that we need in the death and the resurrection of your Son, and you also give us everything that we need to support this body and life, and so we return to you a portion of what you've given to us, that these our tithes and offerings would be used for your purposes, that the gospel might be preached both to us and to others. All this we pray in your Son's name. Amen. In our prayers for this morning, um, just two petitions to add. One is uh, for the family and friends of Rhonda Cachero. Uh, Rhonda is, uh, was Tim Tweedy's sister. She passed away this past week as a result of some long-term complications from COVID-19. And her, uh, her funeral is going to be on the 12th, so this coming Wednesday in Moberly, Missouri. So we want to pray for Rhonda's family and friends as they mourn that loss. Um, and then uh, we want to thank God also for the ninth birthday that Hank Wright is celebrating today. So happy birthday, Hank, and we, uh, we thank God for him, and we'll pray for him this morning. As you're able, please rise. Merciful God, you have sent the promised uh, offspring to crush Satan's head forever by the death of Christ, our Savior. As you gave comfort to Adam and Eve, receiving their meager confessions for the sake of your grace and promising deliverance from sin and its curse, so also comfort us by the forgiveness of sins and give us hope in the promise of eternal life and your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, Christ has made us his brothers by his incarnation and suffering for our sake. Fellow heirs of your undivided kingdom. Give boldness to those who preach, strength to those who work, generosity to those who give, and patience to those who suffer in your church, that we may always do the will of God and so be true and faithful members of the household of God. 
be with all households of our congregation. And remember especially today, Kristen Fears and family, Kristen Michelle Fenwick, Edo and Abby Ferrari and family, Norma Fiedler, Mike and Julia Fitzgerald, and Julie Fitzgerald and family, Don and Carolyn Florini, Doug and Trudy Foster and family, John and Nancy Fouch and family, Carl and Sandy Frankfurt, and Eric and Aaron Frankfurt and family. Lord, in your mercy, give courage to your church, O Lord, that as we believe, we would also speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confident hope that we have in him, that we too will be raised and brought into his presence. Embolden us by your spirit to confess this Christian faith from a lively conscience, that for Christ's sake, grace may extend to more and more people, increasing thanksgiving to your glory. Lord, help us to live our lives as you would have us live. And we thank you for every day that we receive as a gift from your hands. We thank you especially for Hank and his ninth birthday that he's celebrating today. And we pray that he, would, uh, that, that, uh, he would continue to be blessed both this day and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself can stand, and a house divided must fall. Graciously preserve our nation with its government. Frustrate the work of Satan and the seeds of destruction he would, show, he would sow in every place were he not stayed by your gracious hand. Unite our leaders and our people for the common good while leading us to hope in that eternal kingdom which is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord God, hear the, our prayers for all of your saints who suffer in this earthly tent. We remember especially today Katie Spann, Lucy Hale, Renee Valerie, Becky Bodenstab, Eunice Weber, Hilmer and Anna Mae Shanebaum, Pat Benefil, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Joy Lotz, Dan Wiesman, uh, the family and friends of Rhonda Cachero, Debbie Grinstaff, staff, Julie Morrow, Gail Peck, Verna Langendorf, Ed Geertz, Donna Laster, Dave Robertson, Kevin Egebrecht, Russell Nicholson, Todd Kelly, Asher Yates, Maria Whistler, Serenity McMillan, Randy Lambert, Alex Bradshaw, Abram Smith, Pam Wiggins, Daryl Johnson, Bob DeWerf, Al Bolin, Larry Lovejoy, <clears throat> Gary McDonald, Carla Klaustermeyer, Carolyn Wells, Veronica Armentrout, Jim Hubner, Jeff Frome, Richard Dupotz, Carl Monaco, Robert Rombach, Dale Jones, Don Goble, Paul Knobloch, Jennifer Withrow, Sheila Williams, and Dan Shanehair. Do not let them lose heart, but fix their eyes beyond what is transient to the things unseen. By the slight and momentary affliction, prepare them for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When at last you will raise up all, all of us with Jesus and bring us into, your, into his presence. Lord, in your mercy. What is lost in paradise has been regained by the conquering wounds of your Son, crucified and raised again. In him we are restored as your children and made bold to ask for every need. Hear us for his sake and in his name, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Here at Zion, we believe that God's word creates reality. So God says, let there be light, and there's light. God says, let there be day and night, and there's day and light, night. And Jesus says, this is my body, and his body is truly present. This is my blood, and his blood is truly present in, with, and under the bread and wine. So as we speak the words of institution here at this meal, the body and blood of Jesus are truly present in, with, and under the bread and wine here in communion. We believe that here at Zion. The other thing we believe, or another thing we believe about communion here at Zion, is that it is a public profession of our common confession of faith as Missouri Synod Lutherans. So if you're, a, if you're not a, Missouri, a part of this congregation or another Missouri Synod Lutheran congregation, we still invite you, please come forward during this time of worship. Uh, come forward and join us at the rail. But if you just cross your arms like this, as you come around, uh, we'll give you a blessing and uh, love to talk to you afterwards more about how you become part of our, uh, part of our church. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread 
And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated for distribution.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have given us the, the great gift of your Son's body and blood to refre refresh us in our faith and to grant us forgiveness of sins. We pray that you would strengthen us this day toward faith in you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now depart with the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We continue with our closing song.
Please be seated for a couple announcements. Thanks again for joining us for worship. We pray this service will be a blessing to you as we're sent forth to be a blessing to others this week. Uh, a couple things that we had uh, have coming up. Um, tonight, uh, from 5.30 to 7.30, out at the Bethalto Splash Pad, uh, our youngest adult group has that reserved for Zion families. So uh, if, uh, if you, uh, yourself, your kids, whoever, uh, grandkids, whoever wants to come out to that, uh, we'd love to have you. Again, it's 530 to 7.30 out at the Bethalto Splash Pad at the Central Park out there. Uh, and just if you give, give me a heads up uh, as to if you're going to come, that way I try to get enough pizza. Uh, we'll see you there tonight. Uh, earlier uh, today, just, uh, just before the service, we had uh, our Move Up Sunday for our Sunday school kids. Uh, so it's kind of moving up everyone into the next grade. Uh, for some kids, that meant they're in the next uh, kind of group of classes, junior high to high school or that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so starting next week, uh, we'll, if you're confused which class to go to, uh, we'll, we'll let you know from there. Uh, we also started our, our summer adult Bible studies. We're having a men's Bible study downstairs on the fellowship hall, studying the book of Ephesians. And our women's Bible study is meeting in the, the church library down here. Uh, and they're uh, currently doing a study on prayer. So we'd encourage you uh, to join those groups. Great chance to get to know people, dive into the Word together. Uh, those will be every Sunday, 9.30 in the months of June and July. Uh, the last thing uh, that I have is uh, this week is Vacation Bible School here at Zion. We've been kind of talking about that for a little bit. When we first announced, we told people we're planning on about 200 kids. We currently have over 300 that are registered about 175 elementary students, and a whole bunch of preschoolers. Uh, so keep us in your prayers this week uh, for a num number of reasons. Uh, but no, we're, we're really excited uh, for the opportunity to connect with so many kids from our Zion family as well as from our uh, surrounding community uh, and great partnerships with our, our summer camp program uh, to really uh, provide a, a great experience uh, this week. So keep us in your prayers. Uh, that does mean that some of the things that normally happen in the mornings uh, this week, like Pericope's class won't meet because every space we have will have children uh, learning in them. Uh, so if you normally come up here, something during the week, probably from 9 to 11.30, uh, unless you want 50 preschoolers at your ankles, uh, it's probably not happening. But call up if you have any questions. Thanks again for being here and God's blessings to you this week.